another Democratic candidate for attorney general. House lawmakers take aim at anti-Semitism, plus reforming prior authorization and more. From the television studios at WFYI, it's Indiana Week in Review for the week ending January 19th, 2024. Indiana Week in Review is made possible by the supporters of Indiana Public Broadcasting Stations. This week, former Marion County Clerk Beth White says Indiana deserves an attorney general who is serious about their responsibilities. And she says current AG Todd Rokita has created distractions that have hurt, not helped Hoosiers. White, a Democrat, launched a campaign for attorney general Thursday. White currently serves as the head of the Indiana Coalition to End Sexual Assault and Human Trafficking. She's also worked as an attorney for the State Department of Child Services and the Marion County Prosecutor's Office. I want to get back to the business that the Attorney General is supposed to be doing, protecting consumers, making sure that the legal environment is solid in the state of Indiana, protecting uh, seniors in particular from Medicare fraud and other kinds of abuse. White has run for statewide office before, losing the 2014 race for Secretary of State. She says to win, she needs to show Hoosiers a contrast, highlighting Rokita's legal fights with abortion care providers. Doctors are afraid because the environment that's been created is creating fear, and it's unacceptable. White joins Destiny Wells in the race for the Democratic nomination. Does White joining the race complicate things for Democrats? It's the first question for our Indiana Week in Review panel. Democrat, Lindsey Hake. Republican, Chris Mitchum. John Schwannis, host of Indiana Lawmakers. And Nikki Kelly, editor-in-chief of the Indiana Capital Chronicle. I'm Indiana Public Broadcasting uh, State House Bureau Chief Brandon Smith. Forgot my title there for a second. Chris Mitchum, uh, is a contentious convention fight going to make it harder for Democrats to beat Todd Rokita? Absolutely. And if you're the Indiana Democrat Party, I'm not, you hate to see this, and I'd would it'd be hard pressed to think that they'd be behind throwing up a second candidate when you have somebody like Destiny Wells who's qualified she has the state name ID from a previous race and a she's much even, more a much more recent previous race cor certainly. yeah correct and um, she even has experience working in the attorney general's office so I mean that checks a lot of boxes that you would want as a candidate and when it comes to Beth White I mean she, obviously she has every right to run this race you know stake her claim why she's the better candidate but you'll be hard-pressed to find any race, especially in a primary, that if it goes down to the wire, it doesn't eventually get negative. I mean, they're going to start, you know, having to bring the other person down to say why they're the next candidate, right? So whenever you already start with two hands behind your back on a statewide race, if you're a Democrat, this is the last thing you want to see to start alienating any parts of your party when you're going to need them plus a lot more in order to try to, you know, take down the boogeyman in the room. Now, uh, obviously, you're affiliated with Destiny Wells, so you come at this from a certain angle, I understand. But is it clear to you why Beth White is doing this? Well, I'm here to talk about Destiny. And she's uh, obviously one of my ride or dies. I, I would work for Destiny, whether um, it were um, for the, the Attorney General's race or whatever. If she wanted to run for dog catcher, I'd be working for Destiny because she's just a, a fantastic candidate. Uh, her work, as, as Chris points out, in the AG's office already uh, is, is something that gives her a significant leg up. And we've seen a lot of statewide support for her. But that said, you know, I, I, every woman I know who is an attorney wants to take on Todd Rokita. I mean, it's just a terrible candidate right now um, that Todd's made for himself out of this uh, constant pursuit of national press. And, and I'm not surprised that others want to take him on as well. It, it shows a, an incredible appetite for a new attorney general. And, and I'm excited to see what happens. It seems we're collecting former Secretary of State candidates, so I want to know where Jim Harper is right now, <laughs> but uh, if he's going to throw his hat in the ring. But is this somewhat reflective of how much Democrats want to beat Todd Rakita? Yeah, it is. I just, you know, I, I'm sure internally party officials are wishing they had come to some sort of agreement to avoid this. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a state convention fight. It's not going to be hugely cost you know money but it is time that they're going to ha spend uh, focusing inward instead of against the same person that they want to defeat we well, yeah, I, I asked uh, beth white you know um it, the, the same question i asked chris which is 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 this going to hurt your chance uh, the democrats chances of beating todd rakeet in the fall when democrats already have quite an uphill battle against a republican in the statewide race here in indiana and have for a while and she just said she doesn't think it'll be contentious, it'll be a respectful race. I think there's a yeah. decent chance that that's true. Um, 
But is it clear to you why she felt the need to get into this race? I suppose she thinks she would be a good candidate and she wants to beat Todd Rokita. I mean, let's yeah. take it at face value. Um, I, I don't think there's any other great plot intrigue here that's, yeah. that somebody's, some puppet master is trying to play games here. I think it's just interest in, in running. She too comes from a background where she has credentials certainly uh, in terms of administration as it, at the intersection of criminal justice system and, and law. Uh, and certainly now with her work, more recent work with human trafficking and some of those issues, which uh, certainly are front burner issues for the state of Indiana and other states. And for that office, quite frankly. And, and for that, that office, certainly with the task force that's been created, and it's been a, a big issue. Um, you know, the, the answer to this, it seems, there's always two cards, you know, that, that uh, you pull out for a state chair. If you ask, like, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I always used to tease Ann Delaney. If she were here, I'd be teasing her because it's almost like, oh, we have multiple candidates vying for a position. Let me go to card A. That one says this is a great thing because now we can really harden and forge the message. This is a chance to sort of test, to kick the tires and, and see what the weaknesses might be and what the most pet potent messaging strategy is before we get to the general election. Then, of course, if you don't have one, you go to card B and you pull it out and says, this is great because now we can coalesce behind one candidate and we can focus on the general election. You're gonna, those are always gonna be the two answers and so they're dictated by circumstances. Uh, I mean, we have primaries and, and convention fights, fights, debates for a reason, I guess, yeah. so to winnow this down to a single candidate. So I guess maybe we've gotten away from that certainly in, in, in past years, although with the, the gubernatorial race on the Republican side, certainly yeah. we've con come back in grand fashion with contested races, but that's another discussion for another time. I will also say to his point that it is always nice to see a young Democrat coming in into the race. And uh, I said that when Keith announced back when we discussed the Senate this past summer, uh, the U.S. Senate race. So it is great to see a young Democrat interested in the in making problems uh, in sol solutions for problems. Time now for viewer feedback. Each week we pose an unscientific online poll question. And this week's question is, who will win the 2024 race for Indiana Attorney General? Republican incumbent Todd Rakita or a Democratic candidate? Last week we asked you, is the amount of turnover in Indiana's congressional delegation a good or bad thing? 84% of you say it's a good thing. 16% say it's a bad thing. If you'd like to take part in the poll, go to WFYI.org slash IWIR and look for the poll. Well, turning to the State House, the House this week advanced a bill to the Senate that would define and ban anti-Semitism in state public education institutions. Indiana Public Broadcasting Father Comber Weiland reports in its committee hearing, the bill was met with both criticism and support. House Bill 1002 would add a definition of anti-Semitism adopted by several nationwide organizations to the state education code and ban anti-Semitism in public educational institutions. Eli Isaacs is with the Indianapolis Jewish Community Relations Council. He says this bill is necessary because discrimination against Jewish Hoosiers cannot be combated without this discrimination being defined. House Bill 1002 will assist authorities, educators, and administrators in this state who are responsible for spotting and combating anti-Semitism. It will help educate people on what anti-Semitism looks like. It will send a message that Indiana is no place for Jewish hate. Others testifying against the bill argued it would limit free speech and would prevent Hoosiers from openly expressing discontent with a foreign government. Lindsay Haig, quite frankly, is this bill necessary? Yes, and they passed it last year without one no vote. While the Senate didn't hear it, the bill still passed the House unanimously. So yes, this bill needs to move forward. It's clearly time to make it happen, and hopefully the Senate takes it up immediately. We'll see with, with Senator Freeman at the helm now. It did pass unanimously through the House again this session, though there were quite a few members of the Democratic caucus who were not present on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, this, this feels about as hot button as anything can be right now at, at any state house in this country. Um, is this one that is going to create any blowback for, for lawmakers who might I, not <clears throat> um, give full-throated support to it? Yeah. Oh, they're doing. I, I don't think so. I mean, you even had some members of the Democrat caucus vote for it yeah. and then come yeah. out with statements afterwards saying why they voted for it. And yeah. typically, you know, you only do that whenever there's a controversial vote that, you know, your constituents might not like. And unfortunately, you usually saw it on the Democrat side. 
I also found it interesting that um, all 13 members of the House Democrat uh, Black Legislative Caucus were also excused, and I haven't seen any statement from their caucus or anything like that as well, which, um, you know, if that is the case, I know they had some amendments and some, you know, tweaks that they requested to the bill that they didn't get, but no matter how you feel about the bill or whether you think it matters, I just think it's good public policy, especially considering you're not touching the criminal code here, right? You're not saying that if you do this, you know, you're going to be taken to prison or be punished by the state or anything like that. It's simply a policy and allows you to define education probably for the school institutions that you're seeing on a more national level. Um, and really, one of my favorite parts of the bill is it defines that anti-Semitism is not criticizing the state of Israel as you would another country. So you can criticize, you know, Israel's public policy stances and Gaza or their leadership all you want, similar to another country. But it's the you know, some of the expressions we've been hearing around college campuses around the country that I think is what this bill is targeting, giving, you know, the leaders of those college campuses kind of more authority and really just a statutory framework in order to go to these potentially groups of people and say, you know, we're not going to support that on our campus. Um, our, our colleague, uh, Elise Schrock, pointed something out yesterday which hadn't occurred to me but I thought was a, a, a really interesting point, which is for the last several years in Indiana, when you have Republican supermajorities especially, all of the, the hot button social issues that come up on, uh, uh, at the State House, it's Democrats who are united and Republicans who are often fractured. And this, for the first time in quite a while in Indiana at least, is the exact opposite. And how, how do you think Democrats are handling it so far? This is a tough, tough issue uh, for a lot of reasons. I've heard several lawmakers say this is the, <laughs> they, Essentially, this is the most difficult issue to speak publicly about because every word is scrutinized and every sentence is parsed and everybody's looking for some sort of, you know, hidden meaning. And uh, it's almost, I've likened it to the new third rail. It used to be, you know, touch the Social Security and die. Now it's almost as if you touch this issue one way or the other and you suffer some blowback of some sort. It's a tough one. Uh, I mean, if you look at... If the question is, well, let's stipulate, anti-Semitism is horrible, it's stupid, it's idiocy, it's... it's, it's should not be tolerated. Should not sure. be tolerated. Yeah. And Islamophobia, I would say the same. Also a byproduct of stupidity and misinformation many times. The problem, it seems to me, especially when you talk about a public research university, a college campus, which is by definition sort of the... The, the marketplace of ideas, uh, if, any, if ever there were such a thing. Trying to, to protect against this is almost like banning stupidity. I mean, you can have a rule against stupidity. We're not going to allow stupidity on this campus. But how do you, I mean, can you really expect that? This is, there's no statute, no code that is ever going to prevent stupidity on any side of this issue. You will always have uh, misinformed people spewing hatred. Uh, and what I think, because of the challenges surrounding definitions here, this will be something that will not go away quietly, but you will be looking at, well, this, this, the way this is written, you know, it depends on this federal definition and this definition, but, and it talks about state players versus, but what about an individual? Can I uh, say if I don't, can I criticize the, the uh, prime minister of Israel if I'm talking about an individual and not a state because the, the exception carved out is for a country? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, uh, and, it, and there are lots of things you could observe. Some of the most zealous advocates of this legislation were those who were dragging their feet on hate crimes legislation uh, for years. Uh, you know, we finally, in, as a state, enacted uh, something in 2019 that was much watered down, but a lot of people were much very thanks. concerned about it much, then. Much thanks to Senator Freeman, who is the Senate sponsor That's for true. this bill. Well, it's just there are a lot of complexities here, and I... And I tried to choose my words carefully because uh, yeah. there's really no... <laughs> Nikki, I'm going to kind of go back to the first question I asked. Um, it is important to point out that this bill wasn't created in response to what is going on in Israel yeah. and Gaza uh, over the last few months. This is literally a carbon copy of the exact same bill that passed a year ago. Not a comma was different. No, not, 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 even... not, a single, not, yeah, not a single character was different in that bill. But have Republicans made it clear enough why we need it? <laughs> Your turn. As, Your as turn. John has said, yeah. Yeah. Thinking very carefully. Very carefully on this. 
Look, I mean, I, I think the bill reinforces things that are already in our law. We have anti-discrimination protections for race, creed, sex, you know, all of that. And so, but they wanted to restate it, especially in the context of education, because that's where a lot of these conversations are happening. Um, I don't think it necessarily hurts anything, but I'm also not convinced it helps anything. I think it is a strong statement, and that alone is important. Yeah. Um, and so I expect the Senate to move it, even though um, Senator Bray is also choosing his words very carefully and not really, I mean, he wouldn't even really explain what their issues were with the bill last year. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. It, it feels like, and I'm not conflating the two issues, but it does feel a little like the conversation we're having around reading proficiency, which is they're going to put into state law what's already in administrative rules. So here it's they're putting more words into state law, what might, is probably already covered under state law, but doing so does send a message to mm -hmm. the people who may need to hear it, which is really, I mean, to your point, it's not the people who are going to spew anti-Semitic hate. Uh, this bill is not going to change what they do. What it's sending a message to is the leaders of educational yep. institutions to say, hey, we really need you to crack down on this. If anything, it probably, ag you know, Oh yeah, uh, the, pours, yeah but, pours can, fuel but that's on the not fire. the reason to, to no, not No, no, no. And not only is there state legislation, or a statute on the books, I mean, I believe, what, a Title VI federal yeah, funding already fund, yeah. uh, protects this. And uh, theoretically, a, a, an institution could lose its federal funding which essentially would be the death penalty for uh, any state institution. And yeah. quickly, to John's point, even the most staunch supporter of this bill has to recognize that you are op potentially opening up a Pandora's box here of, okay, we define anti-Semitism. What does, you know, you know anti-homophobia language look like? What does anti-Islamophobia, you, know, you know, language look like? I think you're going to have a lot of tough conversations down the road. Insurance companies can require pre-approval for medical services before they will cover it. This is what's known as prior authorization. And Indiana Public Broadcasting's Abigail Ruman reports a Senate committee moved a bill forward this week that would limit the use of prior authorization. The bill would ban prior authorizations for routine and emergency services and common prescription drugs. It also puts limits on both the amount of prior authorizations insurers can require and the time it takes to approve services. Dr. Elizabeth Struble is a family practice physician in rural Indiana. She says patient condition can worsen while waiting for approval, which can lead to more expensive care in the long run. There always seems to be other people in the middle that are not me or my patient and what I know is best for my patient. Struble says prior authorizations put the administrative burden on the providers. Opponents of the bill say prior authorization can be a tool to control the cost of health care. John Chuanis, lawmakers at the State House have been talking a lot about health care costs and health care issues for a lot of years now. In terms of impact, could this be, if it passes in even something close to this form, could it be the most impactful bill they, we've seen? Well, the answer is yes, but the, the second and essential part of that is it ain't happening. Uh, not, in this, not in this form. And you think about, uh, you're right, uh, this has been an issue because we are one of the states in this country that where costs are high. I don't know where the blame should, you know, no one seems to know where the blame, there's a lot of peep finger pointing. Trying to figure that out for yeah, the last Yeah, I don't know who the bad guy is. It's hard to be, <laughs> yeah. have like an old Western where the good guys and the bad guys, because, you know, who's to say? But um, this one is, is, is tough. And it, you've had proposals that had a lot of teeth in them in recent years. Some of the toughest we saw last session where there were essentially caps on, on costs for nonprofit health care facilities. Uh, and if they violated those, there were penalties or they'd, they'd basically claw back the money uh, in some fashion. And so, uh, but did those get to the finish line? No, of course not. They were much, much scaled down, whether it had to do with do not compete provisions for physicians, whether it had to do with, I mean, basically everything that has been introduced on this issue in the last few years, something has passed, but it's much, much different. And I would guess that that is the case here. We will not see something as profound and as provocative as this, because it would, to get back to the first part of your question, it would have a. Yeah, effect. Nikki, how surprised, I mean, I, I, I'll be honest, I was a little surprised to see the language of this bill, as even as, as, it, as it was. Yeah, awesome. it's extremely strong, but as we know, one of the legislative sort of things that happen is you 
you want X, so you ask for this, and then you negotiate down. Mm -hmm. So there might be some, some bartering in there. I do think the fascinating part about this bill is, like prior authorization is a boogeyman, right? We all hate it. We want, we want the test or the drug or whatever that our doctor thinks we should have. But there is a fair conversation to have about whether that is controlling costs in a world where all they want to do is control <laughs> healthcare costs. So this, you know, someone said yesterday that everyone has a terrible prior authorization story and the insurance companies are kind of not popular in that. But um, yeah, so I think they'll settle on something a little a little less strong. Is that a difficult part? Because a lot of the argument from the, the folks who, who don't think prior authorization should be uh, restricted like this say, well, hey, prior authorization is controlling, is helping control healthcare costs. I think it would be, be a surprise to most people to think of healthcare costs as being controlled, but is there some truth to that? If there's ever been a case more clear for Medicare for all, this is it. <laughs> I mean, good Lord, our, the reason our state is ballooning in costs for Medicaid. The reason we have the, uh, what was it, I'm sorry, $1.1 billion in, that we're suddenly missing out of yes. the Medicaid yeah, budget? Close to that. Our state is unhealthy. And it's, it's me, I'm the problem, it's me, that's us. That's, there's so many things we could do better. And that is why our costs are ballooning. Uh, it, would, it would be my great bill. Let's move it forward, but we need more. Do you, do you think that they can get something close to what the bill is right now. Yeah, it's pretty serious for a short do-nothing session, right? <laughs> um, yeah. But <laughs> yes. that's a great but point. Yes. I, I do think so, because to John's point, this just screams House Bill 1004 from last year, where they didn't end up having the price caps, but they did have a couple provisions in there that I know hospitals are bracing for next year when it comes to the site of service. You have an auxiliary you know, location away from a hospital, can you still charge the same fees kind of thing. Yeah. That language survived, and I know of a lot of hospital associations that are scrambling to make sure that they are in compliance with that and it could actually have a significant impact. Yes. So while I don't think every single provision in there is going to survive, you know, maybe you have one or two that just sends a message to say, you know, we're serious about well, trying to get this maybe really message sending when it gets right down yeah. to it. And, I mean, we've, and it really does feel like if you look at the provisions of this bill, if even one of them survives, it could well, have I mean, a yeah. huge, it says, any one of them. It limits them. prior authorization to like 1% of procedures. But if they are basically, as a rule, denying all of them initially, even if you said 10%, that would be a big, yeah. big improvement. Yeah. No, I mean, but also like, you know, the idea of not allowing prior th authorization for some routine services yep. or for emergency yeah. services, even that could have a big yeah. impact on, a, on just getting care to the people who need it more quickly. There's a difference between streamlining and eliminating. I, th I think a lot of the federal and other states yeah. you see is they're certainly streamlining it. There's a lot of provisions in here that simply cuts it out and maybe there's a compromise there. All right, pregnant people could claim their fetus as a dependent on their state taxes under legislation heard in a Senate committee this week. But Tuesday's hearing on the bill is as far as it will go this session. Republican Senator Andy Zay says in the wake of Indiana's near total abortion ban, providing the tax deduction would help support expecting parents and families. His legislation also requires the person getting the deduction to submit a radiology imaging report to prove they were pregnant. You're building that relationship to hopefully get prenatal care and care for that mother and child as they go through the process of um, pregnancy. But opponents of the bill say that's an invasive surveillance of pregnancy, and University of Indianapolis sociology professor Elizabeth Ziff says the measure takes a step closer to fetal personhood, which she worries will be used to criminalize any activity in pregnancy that might risk a fetus. And placing the rights of the fetus or embryo above the rights of the pregnant person Senate Committee Chair Travis Holdman says he won't take a vote on the bill this session because of the ongoing legislative task force studying the state's entire tax system. Thank you, Kelly. It does feel a little like this is uh, State Senator Andy Zay, who is now running for Congress, wanted to get this out there. Uh, but... Is there more? You, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I but, that's a but no, but, uh, no, <laughs> but could you see this coming back next year when they're taking a look at the tax system more broadly? I... I don't think so. I think this was generally a, uh, you know, colleague from the same area who's supporting one candidate for Congress, kind of giving him a platform, some some media. 
Um, I think there are doing, a lot we're doing of that work right here, right now. Yes, <laughs> there are a lot of details on this that were unknown or unclear. At what point does it count? You know, what about miscarriages? What about abortion? I mean, the method of we're, the method of proving that right, you were pregnant. Right. Um, there's just so much there that I don't necessarily see it going anywhere, even next year. But clearly, it was a sort of wink and a nod to to just have the hearing and get the discussion out there. But is it a worthy conversation to have in a state that has restricted abortion uh, the way it has, John? There are a lot of people who want to have that conversation. And even before the Dodds decision, this was a path that a lot of uh, abortion opponents were taking to try to find some sort of personhood or, or status for the fetus uh, as in, in, in the absence of a Dodds-type decision. Uh, but I think this, I mean, what has been said is on point thus far. I mean, this the conventional wisdom is that short session, people want to get done and go home so they can campaign. I, I dismiss that. I think that for a lot of candidates, this is the best campaigning they can do because yeah. they can't get free media like this anywhere else on issues that they know are not going to go anywhere, but they can still wave the flag for their core constituents. Right. That's Indiana Week in Review for this week. Our panel is Democrat Lindsey Hake, Republican Chris Mitchum, John Schwanis of Indiana Lawmakers, and Nikki Kelly of the Indiana Capital Chronicle. You can find Indiana Week in Review's podcast and episodes at wfyi.org slash iwir or on the PBS app. I'm Brandon Smith of Indiana Public Broadcasting. Join us next time because a lot can happen in an Indiana Week. The opinions expressed are solely those of the panelists. Indiana Week in Review is a WFYI production in association with Indiana's public broadcasting stations.